everyone and welcome to our webinar, Choosing Books for the Year One Classroom. I'm Nikki Gamble, Director of Just Imagine, and as well as providing education consultancy and training, Just Imagine runs a book supply website called Best Books for Schools, though you don't have to be a school to use it. I'm also the author of um, Exploring Children's Literature, which has this lovely Red Riding Hood on the front cover, and also co-author of Guiding Readers. And today I'm joined by Sam Keeley. Now, Sam is a former literacy consultant and she's been involved with Just Imagine for many years, contributing to Take One Book and also to Just Imagine Training. But I thought I'd invite Sam to tell you a little bit about what she's doing at the moment and the capacity in which I've invited her to take part in this webinar today. So, hi, Sam, it's great to see you again. I've been missing you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's lovely to see you again, Nikki. Um, and yeah, since September, I've been working in a small uh, village school in Essex um, and I'm working in Key Stage 1. We've got a quite a large Key Stage 1 class. So I was employed to um, teach English specifically um, to Year 1 and 2 while the class teacher teaches maths. So I take Year 1 for half the morning and Year 2 for the other half of the morning. So it's um, a dream job really working with children and working and putting into practice all the fantastic things that I've uh, been doing with Nikki over the last few years as well. So Sam, you're in the middle of Key Stage 1 stats at the moment, aren't you? We Yeah, we've just started ours this week. So we've, we've been doing the maths today and the reading is coming later in the week. OK, well, I'm sure that will crop up again uh, as we talk through uh, our principles and our thoughts about selecting books for the classroom. And you're going to outline or to help me outline some of the principles in our approach for book selection in what is really a critical age, I think you'd agree with that, um, in children's reading development. So I'm going to share some slides with everybody. And I just want to start by giving a brief overview of what we know about readers aged between around five and six. And while there will be individual differences, most children in year one are, of course, already proficient users of oral language and they have a well-developed vocabulary. Now, we do know that the extent of this varies according to the opportunities that they've had for adult-child interactions and also the range of books that are being shared with them. But by and large, we can say that they have a well-developed vocabulary. They will also understand that written language conveys meaning and we know that teachers like Sam and those of you that are checking in today will have been teaching children to read, including the use of a phonic programme. Um, we're interested um, also, as I'm sure you are, in not only teaching children to read, but in helping them understand what it means to be a reader or at least helping them to believe that they're helping them to become um, a reader. This is a crucial part of what we do. And if we only teach children to read and not to become a reader, then of course we risk creating a generation of children who can read, but choose not to read because they don't see what's in it for them. Now, the books that we choose to read are an important point uh, in developing this. Uh, they're so important. I don't know you'd agree with that, Sam. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So the reason I have a slide of each peach pear plum on the screen is that it's one of the books that Margaret Meek discusses in her pamphlet, How Texts Teach What Readers Learn. I expect that many of you have read that pamphlet. And it becomes apparent to us that not all texts are equal when it comes to guiding readers or guiding children towards becoming readers, as opposed to teaching them how to read. Books like Each Peach Plum, as you can see on the screen, make connections with children's previous literary knowledge, in this case, nursery rhymes. They are learning the important lesson that experienced readers know, that is, that books connect with each other. Think for a moment of the number of times that you've read a book and said, it reminds me of, 
It might be another book or perhaps a film, but that's what books do. They connect with other books. And so our knowledge is built incrementally. Books also connect, of course, with our real world experiences. That's making a different kind of connection. Some books, like Each Peach Plum, teach sophisticated lessons. For instance, when we read a book like this, we might learn that the words alone do not carry the meaning. In fact, the stories may be different in the words and the pictures. We learn that whoever is narrating the story may not be telling us the whole truth. And sometimes we might surmise that that is deliberate. So books like Toby Forward's The Wolf's Story provide reading lessons that take us all the way to Edmund's monologue in King Lear when he bemoans the status, his status, and justifies his actions. Our formative reading experiences make us question whether we take his protestations at face value or not. They help, books like this help, develop the critical facility which will later help readers distinguish fact from opinion, real news from fake news. And I'm sure we'll all agree that that is really important in this present day. So in year one, we're looking for books that invite children to think, to fill in what we call the readerly gap, the bits that are left unexplained by the text. I'm sure that most people recognise that books have a role to play as well in building language and vocabulary in rich reading contexts. They're not merely an opportunity to practice or consolidate vocabulary. Choosing a wide range of books is important too. Books with different tones, books with different styles of narration. These help to develop flexible readers who can adapt to new reading demands and can rise to the challenges of new literacies as they emerge. We take all of this into account and importantly, we also think about the readers in classrooms and what their interests are and also their reading interests. And that for me would be the absolute starting point. So I think I need to ask Sam what she's noticed about the reading interests of the children in her class. Um, yeah, it's really, Sorry, Nikki. I was going to say, it's very it's interesting that um, the children, they, um, one of the things that they love to read about is animals, um, but particularly issues around animals, so endangered animals, um, so things that actually are quite sophisticated uh, for five and six year olds. Um, so I was reading, we were reading um, The Journey Home um, mm -hmm. last week, and um, and they really picked up on yeah the fact that they were endangered and and why and that made them want to read other books you know that had sort of similar themes and then find out more about them so um so yeah animals is one thing they of course they do love their dinosaurs and fossils mm -hmm. um and they do they love um they they love humor uh year one children they really do i mean i think all children love a bit of humor um and things yeah you'd expect like unicorns and and that, but I do, I find year one children, young children, they love to know things. They really do love to be knowers of things. So actually having that range of nonfiction is just crucial really in the books that we're sort of inviting them to share and, and enjoy. But yeah, and really they do love the traditional, the traditional tales um, and, and making those connections, I think is something that they really enjoy doing and sort of just spotting links between um, the different books that, that they're borrowing and taking home. We're going to pick up on some of those themes actually, Sam. Um, and I just want to let viewers know that we're mainly talking about books that children will take to share with an adult at home uh, in this particular webinar, rather than books that might form the basis of a teaching programme like Take One Book, for instance, or any other literacy resource that you use in school. I do want to pick up on what you said about traditional tales. Um, I'm a firm believer that children re need a really good repertoire of traditional stories because, partly because of um, cultural capital and how so much, whether it's advertising or politics or 
uh, great literature, how much um, of that knowledge infuses all of those kind of communications. And apart from the obvious delight in those stories as well, uh, but I do think they need to know straight versions rather than ones that are too knowing um, initially, because how can you know what the joke is um, or the irony unless you have something on which to pin it? I don't know if you'd agree with that and how that relates to the children in your class. Yeah, I, I think that's really important. And we can't assume that they're coming into school with that kind of wealth. I mean, I know I read to my own children countless traditional tales. We had the sort of the Ladybird set, which the well-loved tales, which actually are really well written. They have really good language. So um, I think um, it's easy to assume as people working in schools and working with books that all children are having that read to them. Um, so no, I completely agree because otherwise they do, they miss um, something. If you haven't got that foundation of, of knowledge, then how can you appreciate the, the twists in the tale? And also a lot of the versions that children really know well are those more Disney-fied ones, aren't they? The sort of, they come with that film knowledge and they often don't marry up to to the traditional version so i think having those and encouraging them to have you know to share those at home is 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 important but if they're not sharing at home for us to be sharing that with them as well and having those as our read alouds is, is vital mm. so let's go on to i've organized our talk around some key things for us to consider you talked about humor and the first section of books that i want to think about is called let's have fun so I don't know whether the year one teachers that are listening in will recognize this when I say that so many books today are written with a message in mind, very positive messages. And I'm not knocking books that have messages within them, uh, but sometimes they're very heavily um, communicated. So books about climate, uh, books about being a good person, books about good behavior, all important, but actually that isn't necessarily what's going to hook our readers in. They want to be entertained, they want delight, and they don't necessarily want to be taught and to have heavy messages promoted through their books. Just think about some of the classic uh, children's books, Where the Wild Things Are is not teaching children to behave well. Um, the Gruffalo doesn't have a strong message. In fact, some of them are amoral tales. And so my first selection really are books that are just there to delight the reader. Um, and let's have a look at some of them. I don't know if you're familiar with any of them. Um, these are some uh, recent, relatively recent, with the exception of um, where the wild things are. Uh, the Wonderful Bunnies on the Bus. So during uh, lockdown, we work with a number of charities to supply books to children that didn't have books available in the home. And Bunnies on the Bus was one of the books that we chose. And I kid you not, it was the one that we had most feedback on to say how much the children had loved it. It's a story really about anarchic bunnies. I mean, their bad behavior is not ill-intentioned and they're certainly not spiteful, uh, but just through a sheer joie de vivre, uh, they get themselves into all sorts of uh, well, all sorts of problems. Uh, and there are so many stories going on and subplots going on in the pictures that you will want to go back and read it and reread it and you won't get bored for a very long time. It's important that the adults don't get bored with these books. Sam, which do you uh, like from this selection? Uh, well, I Want My Hat Back is one of my all time favourite, favourite books. I love reading that and sharing that with them, um, with children. I just find it, um, it is just so clever and so brilliant. And just that moment where he says, wait, I have seen my hat. And I think that really resonates with, uh, with lots of adult readers, actually. And that point you make about the adults not getting tired of the book is really important because actually we know that when children like a book, they want it again and again and again. So that's one that I think, and I think that offers something for everyone. And I know, um, 
um, Sean Taylor's work, um, a Monster Hungry Phone, is one that it's not one I've managed to get into school yet, but it's one I definitely want because he, again, he does um, he does lots of things really well, but um, but humour is something that you know he's really really clever with. So mm -hmm. no, so those are two. Uh, something we recently did was I picked five funny books and um, and the children heard each book and voted for their favourite and it was really interesting actually the difference between the tastes of the younger children and the older ones in terms of the humour that they enjoyed I found it really a, a really interesting thing um, to, to look at but yeah certainly I want my hat back I think you could read with any age and it's, it's interesting to see the different things I get from it and I think something that they enjoy in year one should be available to them again and again yeah, as they go definitely. through school because they become favourite books become like old friends don't they and Absolutely. children realise that what they understood and read into it when they were five is different to when they're six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so yeah, on. a lot, a lot of the books that we're talking about can be revisited, and deeper understandings come later. That um, point you make about anarchy as well, I think, is really important. That we shouldn't worry that just because children see think the uh, animals people behaving badly in books it doesn't mean that they're going to go and do it we know that as adults don't we that we don't copy it you know I like reading good murder mysteries I'm not going to go out and murder someone just because I've read about it so I think that's true that we need to credit children with that intelligence to enjoy watching that anarchy unfold but yeah. stepping back realizing they're not part of it and also feeling superior because that is something that it um evokes in a, a reader is that you can feel superior to these naughty bunnies. I would never behave like that, would I, kind of yeah. thing. Uh, um, five and six-year-olds love to do that, don't they? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, in similar vein, uh, Emma Chichester Clark, uh, Quentin Blake's Three Little Monkeys, the third one, is out in that series now. They're absolutely delightful uh, stories. Um, and... Yeah, let's have a look at some of the internal spreads. So the first one is from Ben Mantle's Frog versus Toad. Uh, this is a story about a frog and a toad. They both catch the same fly. And you have a kind of escalation um, of warfare between the two, if you like. They start throwing mud at each other. Uh, it doesn't get too serious, you'll be pleased to know. But along comes a crocodile and they suddenly realise that they've actually got more in common with each other than they realised. So that's a really good, fun story. Um, also, this is uh, out uh, recently, I think this month. This is A Mouse in the House by uh, Russell... Um, Oh, name's gone uh, gone blank. Anyway, I'm sorry about that, Russell. This is a, there's a there's a mouse in the house, and it's really fantastic because there's this tiny little mouse, and uh, on the first spread you see this. You can tell the house is different to every other house in the street. It's got the poshest car. It's got the poshest, um, very trendy, I should say. A woman that leaves the house and she's obviously wanting the mice catchers to go in and they are your typical comedy duo Laurel and Hardy one of them giving all the direction the other having to go and do all the jobs and uh, everything they do uh, goes wrong they start by uh, getting um, well they're sent to get a cat uh, but they come back with a dog it's the nearest thing they can find then it's a tiger then it's an elephant uh, and eventually the whole house falls uh, to bits. Um, I think the mouse is still okay. So that's quite good fun. Um, Bunnies on the bus, said a little bit about them already. And there's a new one out called Bunnies in a Boat. So look out for that. Um, and this one is Never uh, Give a um, T-Rex a, a book, Never Read to a T-Rex, basically. Uh, because the more you do, the more educated that they will become and eventually they'll end up wanting to go to school with you and you wouldn't want that, would you? And this is a really nice tone of voice because the appeal to the reader is obviously, you know, as we were saying earlier about the words saying one thing but the intention being something else. So it's saying you wouldn't want this and you wouldn't want this, knowing that in fact it's appealing to the reader to say I would definitely want that, that looks like fun. Uh, so that's another good one there. 
So the next uh, section that I wanted to talk about was the importance of rhyme, rhythm and voice. And let's pick up on some of the rhyming stories. Uh, again, I'm sharing some uh, old favourites with you as well as some newer books. So we've got the wonderful uh, Quentin Blake's Mr Magnolia, who has only one boot. Uh, you'll notice in that story that he plays a flute and I think he might even wear a suit. And of course, we know that they don't have the same uh, spelling rhymes. It's just the oral rhyme. And that's actually quite important for drawing attention, children's attention to um, the complexities of language. And even if you're not specifically teaching it at that point, it's something that becomes very memorable and something that you can go back to later. Uh, Sam, do you have a, any concerns or thoughts about that when you're introducing rhyming texts that may not match up to what you're doing in phonics at that particular point in time? Um, no, I think I, it's a really good thing when it comes up. I think actually we need to embrace that as teachers. We want our children to be curious about the language they encounter. So, um, you know, I would draw attention to it if um yeah not every time because you don't want to stop and spoil the fun but often children will notice and say oh yeah they rhyme or they'll say oh but they look this they look different and actually um that sort of rigorous phonics teaching gives them the vocabulary to do that mm -hmm. so they'll be saying oh that digraph is different though they sound the same so they've actually they're able to talk about it quite explicitly which i think is um is only to be celebrated and yes it might not match you know at the time or you know you it might match part of what you're doing it might be you've just done that particular diagraph and there it is appearing in there but um but yeah i i wouldn't shy away from it i think if we do then we turn phonics into something that becomes so discreet that it becomes meaningless mm, really good point i mean harry mcclary again another classic there but i've put it up because i think it's the first book that my son memorized um, and I still remember it word for word uh, from the days of reading that aloud with him. And this is another important point about the continued importance of rhythm and rhyme. It's to do with the memorability and the sticking um, of, of the text as well. So these are books with very strong rhythms, but even the rhythm of other uh, non-obvious uh, books is important to have that kind of flow and that a fluidity through it which will help to make the text more memorable um what about the girl with the dinosaur yeah that was one um, that uh, my class really loved i like the fact that it's a girl and a dinosaur because there is sometimes the assumption particularly the boys will think you know that, that dinosaurs are a boy thing though they didn't really comment on that so i was pleased with about that but again that's a very it's a gentle uh, rhyming book because I mean sometimes they can be kind of all out and kind of all guns blazing can't they with the rhyme is is very obvious but um that's a quieter one but mm. um but yeah really nice themes in that one so yeah like you said rhyme doesn't it doesn't have to be there as a comic kind of mechanism um so yeah and I think that the illustrations were really powerful mm. in that one they they mm. really appealed to them and again the children don't always want the just the cartoon type illustrations I find they really appreciate the kind of these kind of I don't know how quite how to describe it but it's a gentler style mm. of illustration um mm. and more maybe more artistic or yeah traditionally artistic I don't know but but yeah that's certainly one that really again really resonated with them really important there about you know this being a different kind of rhyme it's not as obvious you know the beat isn't going to you're not going to be plonking that out as it were uh, so I think it's important to read this uh, yourself and get a sense for how you're going to convey that rhythm and that rhyme through the reading so that it's a really successful read aloud. Should we have a look at some of the internal spreads just to delight everybody? Oh, uh, this one is from um, the book uh, about the eyebrows of doom there. So basically, these are two naughty slugs that uh, land on the faces of different creatures and when the eyebrows are on these it, it's completely mad okay so when the eyebrows are on uh these animals do really naughty things uh at the end uh order is restored as the slugs 
fall into the sea but there are some sea creatures there so we don't know where that story is going next anyway it's great fun it's another anarchic one um, a rhyming story mr magnolia you can see him with only one boot on there we've mentioned him already and the girl with the dinosaur uh, so another obviously really important uh, aspect of choosing books in any year, including year one, will be about the inclusivity. Uh, Sam, I happen to know your school and you're not in an area of high um, ethnic um, diversity. So is it important to you, though, to still choose inclusive books? I think it's almost more important or at least just as important because um and i, I think the 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 stories the, the books are, are important in themselves that um yeah the the selection there um they're not it yeah can bear ski is a really good example that i think um if you ha you know have a hearing impairment i think you will relate to it and see yourself in that book but actually it's important for children. It's developing that empathy, isn't it? And that kind of more rounded world view that we want from them um, that makes it really um, crucial. So it's something that I think if you don't um, think, consider inclusivity to be important, whatever your setting, then you're doing the children a huge disservice. Um, it's not putting a book in for the sake of it and to tick a box. It's actually just about you know, stories that are great stories um, non-fiction that's great non-fiction because that will celebrate inclusivity mm, definitely and you can see also from the selection on the slide here that we're talking about it in a very broad sense as well um, i've put here the biography picture bio picture book biographies are great in years one and two because you can read about the achievements of others um, through a story format, through a narrative. And they are really inspiring stories. And this one here is the story of the deaf percussionist, Evelyn Glenny, um, who wasn't born deaf, but um, acquired her deafness uh, during her, I think, childhood, teenage years. Um, we've got pirate mums in there. That's a family with two mums. Um, and we've obviously got things like clean up the wonderful Dapo, Adiola and Nathan, uh, Byron's uh, stories. Um, let's have a look at some of these internal spreads. This one is from You Can by Alexandra Strick and illustrated by Steve. Um, what's happening to my, what's happening to my, <laughs> Anthony? Steve, I know you so well, and I'm so sorry. My my brain is really freezing up today. Steve Anthony. So what I really love about this book is that we're following the uh, life trajectories of a number of child characters. You can see them here. Probably they're around age six or seven in this particular spread. But you're following them from babyhood to adulthood. And that's a really unusual journey to see in children's books. Um, and I actually love the way that it does that. So it is all aspirational. It is all about the things that you can do. But it's just presented so well. Um, this one coming up next. Uh, this is from Bez. Um, the one that you're talking about. Uh, oh, can be can be uh, because actually uh, this is the character who thinks he hears everybody saying can bears ski um, so beautifully illustrated by Polly Dunbar uh, and this is an interior from the pirate mums that I was talking about uh, there so the thing about the pirate mums is they don't behave like an ordinary family in as much as they don't use maps to find out where they're going. Um, they like to dance jigs and sing sea shanties. And of course, they decide to go on the school trip. Uh, I think the children are a little bit mortified uh, by their mothers, but then find out that actually being a pirate can be useful on some school trips after all. 
And this one is from the lovely uh, Dress with Pockets uh, by Lily Murray and illustrated by Jenny Lovely. Uh, it's beautiful and delicately illustrated. It has the most glamorous aunt in it who takes her niece off to uh, the shops to buy a new dress and she can't find a dress that she likes. They go through all sorts, ballerina dresses, glittery dresses, black dresses, none of them are right. And they're not right because they don't have pockets in it. And this little girl needs her pockets because she likes digging, she likes collecting toads. Um, and they both leave the dress shop with both the glamorous, um, well-dressed well, um, aunt and her niece uh, purchasing dresses with pockets. So that's a really joyous uh, book. Uh, so we definitely, as well as delighting and rhyming and uh, promoting inclusivity, we do want to raise human beings who think of others other, other than themselves and have uh, good emotional literacy and empathy. So here were some of the books that um, I selected. Do you know any of these, Sam? Um, I know a list, uh, longest strongest thread. Um, I know a little. I read it. I read it a while ago, um, and think again. That's a, a really relatable um, story. Um, I think the forgettery would be one that um, I would. My daughter would appreciate because my uh, mother-in-law has dementia. So I think that's a, another one that um, yeah we can put a book into a child's hand at just the right time, can't we? And um, and help them at a particular time as well as. And building empathy, um, mm. sort of in, in a more general sense. I think most children are going to encounter an adult in their family who has dementia, whether it's a, a, the grandparent uh, generation or the great grandparent generation, as it is quite possibly likely to be. Um, having had, uh, you know, a parent with dementia myself, I know how cruel society can be. Um, so I think really tackling this with children at an early age rather than treating it as something that is scary or frightening i think that's really important um, there are a couple of really good books out uh, at the moment and this is one of them the forgettery the longest strongest thread is about a separation between uh, a grandmother and her granddaughter the granddaughter and mother and father are moving to a new country and she has this very close bond with the grandmother uh, it's about the grandmother making her a yellow coat. Yellow is the colour that connects them. Um, a yellow coat to take with her uh, to her new home. And they're sort of connected by this thread, this bond that will never break. It's a lovely, gentle story. Um, one of my favourites on here is The Friendship Bench, which is published uh, just last month. Uh, Wendy Madour and uh, Daniel Enyus. And this is um, about an inspired teacher, actually, because the little girl's just moved into an area. Uh, she has to start school. She's not allowed to take her pet dog with her, who is a real friend and comfort to her. Uh, and she finds it difficult to make friends. But there is a friendship bench in the school and the teacher kind of encourages her to use this friendship bench and she says but there's already somebody there it's not working it's not working and gradually she sits on the bench and the other person that's on the friendship bench also decides that it's not working so they fix the bench in the most creative way a really delightful story um, in fact i love all of the books here on this slide so let's look at some internal spreads there you are that's the longest strongest thread uh, this one is from the forgettery, the little girl helping her grandmother uh, to remember things. Uh, there's another book out at the moment called Phyllis and Grace. And um, what's lovely in that story is you see the advancement of the dementia um, and the little girl who makes no judgment, actually, but just uh, does what's needed at that time. And that's just such a very moving uh, relationship. Uh, that's from the friendship branch that I was telling you about. And you can see here in this spread, the little boy, you can just see the top of his hair on that bench. Again, you know, this isn't stated in the book. You're having to understand why she thinks that the, the bench is busy. What's actually going on there? Um, it's beautiful. 
And this one is from Gustavo, which is not about Halloween, but about the Mexican Day of the Dead and a little ghost who also has no friends, but his friends uh, rally round and they prepare a fantastic Day of the Dead party for him. Uh, it's very cute. Uh, and this one, uh, Mammoth by Anna Kemp, who you might know from Rhino, Rhino's Don't Eat Pancakes um, and uh, other stories. This one is about a mammoth who wakes up from the Ice Age uh, to find that the world has changed and doesn't fit into that world, uh, but it gradually again uh, comes to make friends. And it's a story about making friends and accepting um, accepting difference, but it's done in such a delightful way. I think I think your readers would like that one, Sam. I think so. I know. That looks a good one. So you were talking about nonfiction beyond the curriculum and us finding nonfiction that reads aloud well. Um, what's worked well in your class? Um, well, one that we've just been reading is the one day um, on our blue planet in the rainforest, um, which is that sort of lovely narrative um, non-fiction. Um, that's been a particularly good one, uh, which then has led them to others in the series. Um, and that was a nice one because it, it linked to the curriculum, but has led them onto other ones that don't necessarily link. Um, and I think that's so important because if we only read what links to our curriculum that narrows the range so much and actually we want to build knowledge um, in children and sometimes um, the book they read then that knowledge they've gained does actually impact when you're talking about something else they make those links um, much more effectively because they've built that knowledge through uh, through the non-fiction that they've read so I think we're really we are in that sort of golden age aren't we of, of having um, really good choice that I think just wasn't there when I started teaching sort of 20 25 years ago um, it would have been hard to find things but now just everything there I think just would read aloud so well I mean all through the night um, is, is sort of perfect one and we're not going to be doing a topic about what people do necessarily at night but it doesn't matter it's just about mm. you know, getting those quality texts into children's hands it's intriguing what happens at night time when you're asleep anyway. I always used to be fascinated by that. Um, although I probably wanted to stay up and take part in it if the truth be known. <laughs> anyway, uh, Catherine Barr, this is the one um, that, uh, what jobs could you do? I love the way uh, Catherine Barr kind of relates it to what kind of person do you feel you are? Uh, what makes you happy? Do you like being messy? Uh, do you like, um, you know, creative things, playing a musical instrument. Clearly children are going to change uh, as they grow up. But I just like this idea of there are lots of things that you could do out there. There's something for everybody and really valuing the things that children enjoy doing, including being messy. Uh, all through the night that Sam mentioned uh, reads aloud really well in these lovely crepuscular colours with that bright orange of the night workers really standing out so uh, strongly against that background. It's just a delight to what, look at, isn't it? As well as have read aloud. Uh, a little bit more text in this one, but again, great for reading aloud. This is um, um, a mathematician just like me. You might know this series. There's one on coding, one on science. Uh, again, just opening up all sorts of possibilities. You can be what you want, um, these books are saying. Uh, Laura Hawthorne's absolutely beautiful illustration for the night flower, this kind of lyrical read and the, uh, the beauty of the illustration matched by the lyrical text. Uh, have you read that one at all, Sam? I've read it, but quite a long time ago. Um, but yeah, I do remember thinking it's just that beautiful language um, that, you know, is just just so perfect, isn't it, for reading aloud? I think I must be attracted to nighttime things because there are two <laughs> nighttime books in here. 
Uh, and this one again, uh, this one is about the uh, apes and the, the birds that and the language of love. So there are lots of different creatures in here and we learn about the different ways that they display or talk to each other. Um, uh, just fascinating in view of what you were saying about children wanting to know more about animals, but definitely want to read aloud uh, to them. So moving on, I think most of what we've talked about is in picture book format. Um, tell us a bit about your classroom. Do you? I, I'm guessing it's not all picture books. No, there is um, a range of, um, um, we do uh, read aloud chapter books. Um, we're a because it's mixed age. I know you're talking about year two next week, but we also um, have you know, chapter books that we incorporate into their reading time um, because theirs works a bit differently to our phonics reading practice groups. Uh, but no, we encourage um, picture books, not just, uh, sorry, chapter books, not just for read aloud time, but um, for them to take home and share with parents as well. Um, and, and just having all those different, that range of different formats. So you've got the picture books, the nonfiction, the, um, some gra you know, having some graphic novels as well, which I know um, you've got Bumble and Snug there. Um, so yeah, that, that's, again, that's something that's really important. I think there can sometimes be that idea that chapter books are for older children or they move on to them sequentially through um sort of the reading scheme and i think no they, they need to be exposed to these and i know with my own children i used to read them chapter books at quite a young age because mm. then they develop that stamina for reading that's yeah that we know that they need longer term such an important point that and fans of bumble and snug uh, will be delighted to know that there is another one coming this year and i one can't wait. I love those two characters. Uh, let's just have a look at some. There you are. There's an internal spread of Bumble and Snug. Um, and the Kitty Books, uh, Oxford University Press at the moment, producing quite a lot of these uh, small format books that work really well for sharing with this age group. Still highly illustrated, some in full colour and some in just uh, two colour. Um, and uh, if I can just go back a little bit and show you uh, the Marv book that is on there is one of those, as is Isadora Moon, whereas uh, Nick Hill and Jay by Chitra Sounders, just black and white line illustration. Um, and then we've got a couple of books on here from the uh, Barrington Stoke Little Gem series, Beach Puppy and Nick Sharrett's Splash Day. Uh, the Little Gem series covers quite a wide range in terms of reading um, ability. So these are the ones that we've selected uh, for our year one of the pack. Um, let's go through. Um, so I was just going to say it's important, isn't it, to have our old treasures alongside our new. It can be so easy just to get swayed by what's coming, what's coming, what's coming in two months, what's coming in three months. And yet there are so many good books out there already. So I think hanging on to the real treasures uh, and celebrating those. Uh, I know you've got some particular views about this, Sam. Yeah, no, I think um, I think you have to have these these old treasures need to be there and um, yeah, really visible in classrooms because we again we can assume that child, all children will have read our babies for example and um that was uh, the story i first used with the class i'm working with and um and a lot of them hadn't ever seen it before or they looked and said oh i think i've seen this book so it might have been one that was read to them and um, i'm often surprised actually because uh, parents will have these books at home for their children but as soon as they start school it seems that sometimes they just get rid of them I think they've kind of they've outgrown them um so i think we do we have a sort of again a duty to introduce those to children and make sure they're there and and also included in um those kind of the books that we want them to take home to share um so there are so many classics there i mean i think every single book there is a book that i've read to a class at some point um or used you know to teach um, an aspect of reading with with a class so yeah, they, they are. They have to be there. They have to be in our yeah. book corners accessible and, and parents as well who might not have, have seen them. Um, I love that idea as well of, you know, books that become part of our shared experience. So, you know, we will um, 
we, we all enjoy talking about books that we have in common. Uh, and if we're always going with what's new, what's new, what's new, there's never ever share any shared content. Whereas with some of these long established books, think about where the wild things are, how many generations of children, of people, of adults have shared that book and therefore have a common experience to draw on. So I think that's quite, quite important and something that might be um, overlooked. Uh, but of course, we want plenty of new books too. Um, we do on uh, Best Books for Schools have a couple of easy purchase packs. We've got the Teacher's Treasures, which is that um, classic one. When I say classic, you'll notice that I've got John Classen in there because it has stood the test of time. You know, it's been through more than one generation of that age of child. So it's got that long longevity in it. Uh, so I'm not talking about necessarily old, old classics. And then we have our best books uh, for year one. And these are updated um, every six months so that you can get the kind of fresh selection in there um, if you want to. So Sam, it's been honestly such a pleasure to uh, catch up with you again. Uh, we don't do this often enough. And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. It's really important. I didn't know. Do you want me to finish just by saying about how I use, how I have that balance of the phonics and the sharing books very quickly? Because I don't think we that actually would be got great. that. Um, yeah. So just one of the things that I know lots of year one teachers um, struggle is that balance where you have your, your you were teaching our phonics in our formal way. Um, we have um, our reading practice books that are linked to our phonics scheme. Um, and so the children change those um, every week, but also then I have brilliant, what I call brilliant books, um, and they are these kinds of books. So it's a mixture of these kind of the newer, but also a mixture of the older ones. And they're the books that the children share and take home every week. But the most important point about them, I think, is the fact that they don't just choose one and take it home and bring it back and choose another. We do a lot of talk about those books. So when they bring it back, we ask them to um, talk about what it was they loved about this book, why would someone else like it, and that just builds up that kind of excitement about um, reading in the classroom. So you end up with the waiting lists because um, lots of them wanted Oi Frog. Uh, one boy got very excited about Free Range Freddy, um, the rhyming story by Rachel Bright, uh, which then let me find, I could then find him other books uh, by Rachel Bright and then other rhyming books to read. Um, but also it was that making sure that I was reading some of them to the children as well. And that's actually how you build up that really good knowledge about their interests and what they like to read. Um, and that's part because that teacher knowledge is vital, isn't it? We have to have that yeah. knowledge of the books so that we can recommend them, but also of the children. So it's that thing of just matching the right book at the right time to the right child. And that can make all the difference in sending them off on that journey to being a reader. And making really explicit, we made it very explicit to the parents, the difference between a phonic book they were bringing home to read to their parent uh, versus the brilliant book they were bringing home to have read to them. And yeah, that's that was something that was just really important to put in place. But by doing that, the children can see the point of kind of learning the phonics is because then there's this world of other amazing books out there that you can read and they take them home and share, but lots of them want to read them themselves and parents will say oh they they actually had a really good go at reading it which is brilliant we always want to hear that too but that just gives you a little flavor really of how it works in you know in our class thanks so much sam and can i just say i'm going to redeem myself now because i have just recalled it's russell ato russell, <laughs> if you're ever listening to this i am eating humble pie Please forgive me in the moment that just disappeared out of my brain, but your books do not disappear out of my brain. So, um, so sorry about that. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for this webinar. Um, and we will be looking at choosing books for year two next. And that is with the wonderful Kieran Satie. So thank you, Sam, for joining me. And thank you to everybody else. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Nikki. Bye. Bye.